From the heart of Yerevan, this is Civil Net's Daily News Digest. I'm Maria Titizian, and here are the top stories for Wednesday, February 12. A joint commission of the EU and Armenian parliamentarians failed to adopt a concluding statement. Also, the controversial mandatory pension system remains at the center of the Armenian public's discontent. Plus, the consumption of staple goods in 2013 has declined compared to the previous year. And later, special guest Sarah Andragolian talks about the inspiration behind her visual storytelling. Have attitudes in European circles regarding Armenia changed? A joint commission of the European Union and Armenian parliamentarians, the Armenian EU Parliamentary Cooperation Committee, last week seems to suggest that they have. For the first time in 10 years, the commission did not adopt a concluding statement because of disagreements over references to the Gharapakh conflict. The European members were lobbying for a wording that seemed to blame Armenia for the dismal lack of process in establishing peace in the region. There were even suggestions that the French co-chairmanship of the OSCE Minsk Group be replaced by the EU. The impression among the Armenian delegation was that President Serge Sarkisian's abrupt decision to have the country join the Russian-led customs union might be the core of the issue. However, questions remain about whether the Armenian delegation was working effectively and diligently, and how much much of Azerbaijan's caviar diplomacy has played a role in this strained relationship. The Constitutional Court of Armenia has been making pension deductions from its own employees born after 1974, who will be part of the new mandatory pension plan pillar. On January 24, the Constitutional Court suspended the law's entry into force until it determined the constitutionality of the controversial new measure. That suspension included postponing the mandatory payments until the decision was made. Since this decision, several state bodies have issued contradictory interpretations. On February 4, the State Revenue Committee announced that those employers who did not withhold and transfer the pension payments from their employees would not be subjected to penalties or fines by tax bodies. On the other hand, the Central Bank of Armenia announced that employers must continue making the pension deductions. And continuing with the pension issue, reports emerged yesterday that the employees of the Sardarabad Museum, located in the Mars of Armavir, were being forced to choose their private pension fund companies. Some were even threatened with termination of employment if they failed to meet their administration's demands. The civil initiative Dem.am, that has been protesting the pension reform, said that they had received anonymous phone calls from the museum's employees reporting this. Civil Nets Noir Dalakian went to Armavir to speak with the employees to find out firsthand what the situation was. The staff at the museum were driven to Yerevan in government vehicles to choose their pension fund at a corresponding banking institution. Some of those employees told our reporter that they had done so through their own free will. Yet a few of them went on to say that in Armenia, quote, nothing happens according to a person's will or desire. In recent days, workers across the country have been protesting deductions from their salaries for the controversial mandatory pension system. Early this morning, employees of Yerevan's metro or subway system also staged a protest against pension deductions from their salaries. CivilNet streamed the protest live. The consumption of staple commodities in Armenia has declined. According to the National Statistical Service, the consumption of bread, eggs, poultry, sugar, butter, electricity, gas, and other staple goods in 2013 decreased compared to 2012. In particular, the consumption of bread declined by 3,700 tons, eggs by more than 22 million, and the production of electricity contracted by more than 326,000 kilowatts per hour, or by more than 4%. The country's statistical service also released the migration figures, and accordingly, more than 42,000 citizens of the Republic of Armenia have left the country. The four opposition parties represented in the National Assembly, the ARF, Heritage, Armenian National Congress and the Prosperous Party of Armenia will hold meetings to make a final decision on starting the process of a vote of non-confidence in Armenian Prime Minister Tikran Sarkisian. We will be following those events. The Armenian National Committee of America has issued an open letter to U.S. state legislators calling on them to take a stand against foreign interference in American civic life by President Ilham Aliyev of Azerbaijan. The letter, signed by ANC Executive Director Aram Hamparian, says that Aliyev is pressuring state legislators into joining his, quote, angry and increasingly violent attacks upon his Christian Armenian neighbors, end of quote. Media in the U.S. has extensively reported about charges of Azerbaijan 
Pakistani influence of U.S. policymakers. In the letter, Hamparian goes on to say, quote, It is in the spirit of our American democracy that I ask you to ensure that this foreign dictator is not allowed to hijack your state legislator in his hateful campaign against the Republic of Armenia and the free people of the nagorno karabakh Republic. U.S. Ambassador to Azerbaijan has said that the U.S. is becoming more active in the resolution of the Gharapakh conflict. He made these comments during a meeting with students at the ADA University in Baku. The ambassador said, quote, I can understand the frustration of the Azerbaijani people about the nagorno karabakh conflict. We are committed to trying to bring about a resolution. He also said that it was a good thing that the presidents of Armenia and Azerbaijan met in November 2013 and he stressed the importance of continuing the negotiation process. He added, we will keep pushing the best we can. In the meantime, state legislators in Hawaii have co-sponsored legislation recognizing the 22nd anniversary of Khojalu and calling on the U.S. to strengthen its efforts to facilitate a political statement on the Armenia-Azerbaijan conflict. Representatives Rida Kabanila and Mark Takai traveled to Azerbaijan last year on a $8,000 trip that was paid for by Azerbaijan. Armenian Americans and other critics are concerned that the lawmakers are trying to rewrite history in favor of Azerbaijan. Kabanila who is a retired lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Army Reserve, said her military background taught her the importance of Azerbaijan as a strategic U.S. ally. According to an article that appeared in the Honolulu Civil Beat, Kabanila is quoted as saying, Maybe the resolution is not 100% accurate. I don't know if it is or not, but the fact that they are an ally and support our troops in the region, they don't have to say anything more after that." End of quote. Sevak Balikce was a Turkish-Armenian soldier who was killed during his military service in the Turkish Armed Forces on April 24, 2011. He was killed in the southeastern region of Batman, Turkey, where he was serving his final days as a conscripted private. According to official reports, he was killed unintentionally while joking around with his friend. Sevak's mother, Ani Balakçı, has severely criticized Turkish author Ayşe Gülen's statements on CNN Turk last week. During that interview, the well-known Turkish author had said that the Armenians weren't butchered without good cause. Mrs. Balakcha on her Facebook page said that such announcements are the reason why Armenians are shot and stabbed in Turkey. According to a new study entitled Current State of Armenia's Media Industry, Armenia's saturated media industry might see larger media outlets consuming smaller ones as media trends continue to shift. The extensive study was conducted by the Yerevan Press Club and emphasized shifting trends in how Armenian citizens watch and read the news. Television broadcast news is in decline as the audiences are now getting the news from mobile and online sources. Not surprisingly, many viewers surveyed indicated that they do not trust broadcast news because of the underlying political bias in the reporting. Experts also claim that mainstream media, particularly print media, are already becoming irrelevant and cannot compete with the new forms and styles of media. The report continues by stating that smartphones and tablets have replaced the traditional forms of media as viewers prefer short and fast news to the traditional long written materials. Today I have a special guest here with me. Her name is Sarah Andragolian and she is a documentary photographer and attorney. Her visual storytelling is compelling, sometimes painful, but always powerful. And her core mission is to inspire change. Sarah, your work has been recognized um, and supported by many international institutions and organizations as well as uh, Armenian local organizations and uh, you I was gonna say write, but you don't mm -hmm. write you tell your stories through your photos mm -hmm. um, you're an attorney so that sense of justice I assume is very very strong uh, in you what inspires you um, to do the really difficult stories, like the one you did recently on non-combat deaths in the military. How do you, how do you go about telling that story? Uh, well, it's definitely a process, and um, for me, being part of that process is the most rewarding part of this work, despite the fact that it's difficult. Um, mostly I talk to people. You just spend a lot of time uh, hanging out, you know, around kitchen tables and uh, in the case of the combat death story on the front lines, and, and just talking to people and spending time listening. Um, it's, it's a very sensitive and delicate issue and oftentimes we don't like to talk about these things because mm -hmm. sometimes they are too painful. 
uh, to talk about, yet it's important that we do raise those issues. You did a, a recent story on the 20th anniversary of the Spidak earthquake that happened in uh, 25th anniversary, excuse me. 25, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. in 1988. Um, and it was called Gyumri Rising. And I remember watching, you know, and I'm prone to being emotional, obviously. <laughs> I remember watching it and being, and being so moved by, th by the stories you were telling just by photos, mm -hmm. putting them together and telling the story through those photos. How was that for you? Well, um, the Gyumri project was uh, very important, obviously, because uh, we decided to collaborate with CivilNet and HETC, and this was going to be our, you know, the piece that we were going to come out with, um, the two no news organizations and myself. And so I definitely felt a, a massive amount of pressure to, to produce something that was um, not just uh, reflective of the reality of where Gyumri is now, but also uh, simultaneously truthful and inspiring. Mm. That's a really tough, tough balance. Sure. You don't want to turn people off if you, you know, if you have too much sort of um, destitution in your imagery. People are turned off, and especially as it relates to Armenia and uh, you know the news coming out of Armenia. Um, so it was a tough balance, and at, at, towards the end of the project, I decided to actually insert my own personal experience in it, and um, seems that people responded to they that. They did, they did, and it's always important to leave that little bit of hope, isn't it? Because mm -hmm. that, that's what keeps us going. That's right. Um, Thank you for joining me here today at CivilNet Studio. I want to remind our guests, our audience, that my guest was Saran Dragolian, an award-winning photojournalist uh, based in Yerevan and an attorney. And we hope to be seeing some stories uh, that she produces with us here at CivilNet. Uh, Look forward to that. Thank you very much. Thank you. And in our continuing coverage of the 2014 Sochi Winter Olympics, we want to bring to you a unique and interesting piece of Olympic trivia. As reported earlier, Armenia is represented by four athletes at this year's Winter Olympics, three cross-country skiers and an alpine skier. Sergei Mikhailian, one of the cross-country skiing competitors, was Armenia's flag bearer during the opening ceremonies. Surprisingly, just 12 years earlier, his mother, Alla Mikhailian, who was also representing Armenia as a skier in the 1998 Nagorno, uh, Winter Olympics also served as Armenia's flag bearer. This is the first time in Armenian Olympic history that both mother and son have represented Armenia in the same way. Seems like skiing is a family tradition in the Mikhailian household. The exchange rate is up on your screen as we take a look at your forecast. It's going to be a sunny day in Yerevan with a high of 3 and a low of minus 5. Gyumri will have a high of minus 3 degrees Celsius and a low of minus 16. Stepanagert will have a high of 9 and a low of 0. And our travel forecast takes us to the historically rich city of London, the capital of Great Britain, where the high will be 8 and the low will be 4 degrees Celsius. Humans have settled in the London region for millennia. In 2010, foundations of a large timber structure were discovered near the River Thames dating to 4500 BC. The actual etymology of London remains unknown, but specialists have linked the name London with the previous Celtic inhabitants of the area. Stone and Bronze Age settlements are scattered throughout most of the British islands, most famous being the Stonehenge. Throughout much of antiquity, the British islands were contested by the Romans and the Byzantines. In the Middle Ages, the British islands developed a very complex feudal system. Fast forwarding to the modern era, Great Britain primarily ushered in the Industrial Revolution, making production and trade more efficient and changing the face of the planet forever. Not surprisingly, Great Britain does have an Armenian connection. According to the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles, it was the Armenians that first populated the area known as Britain. The chronicle was written in the early Middle Ages and commissioned by King Alfred the Great. Although many ethnic Armenians have contributed to British history, one individual stands out and has an Olympic connection. During the Roman and Byzantine times, Armenians were often sent to the British islands as warriors, mercenaries, or even for punishment. King Varastat, who reigned Armenia between 374 to 378, is one of the last recorded competitors of the ancient Olympic Games that took place in the city of Olympia. Varastat's victory was in the bare-knuckle boxing event in the 360s, and his victory is attested in a surviving memorandum now kept at the Olympic Museum. However, after his victory and during his reign, he was accused of treason and banished to the British Islands and most likely died during his exile. Given that the Sochi Winter Olympics are taking place, we thought that this story would be worthwhile to share with you.
And that's our digest for this Wednesday, February 12th. We'd love to hear your comments, so you can write to us at english at civilnet.am. We leave you today with the Celtic fiddle and Bodron music by John Morris Rankin. Thanks and see you tomorrow.